Testing, test. Okay, microphone's working. Let's get started. So here's the thing, folks. Usually I'll be doing these recordings on Mondays or Tuesdays. I'll shoot for Mondays. But right now, like a lot of you, I'm still limping along with a really flawed conversion to ebook format uh, of the textbook. So it's been uh, troublesome to say the least. Um, so can forgive me if I'm a little behind. So let's begin. I want to make some general observations. First, in academe, in order to establish one's ethos, which is to say evidence that your statements are to be taken as authoritative, you need to support assertions with either pure reason or via citing credible sources. Thus, if a scholarly text makes broad statements of fact that are not supported or has a paucity of footnotes to support those points, that should be a red flag right there. That said, in reference to our reading this week, uh, there are two key terms in the first chapter that are used but not directly defined. And a third term for what is being set out that is, I think, implicit but not directly referenced. So let's begin with the first one. This is a text on the philosophy of religion. So what the heck does this word philosophy mean? Uh, you know, there are probably as many different definitions of philosophy as there are philosophers. And it's actually a subject of considerable debate and wrangling among those who work in this area. As I tell my students at Chapman University, um, if you really want to start a fight at an academic conference road to philosophy, this is the question you would have to ask. What the heck does philosophy mean? Mind you, why would you want to start a fight amongst philosophers? Pretty sad. Anyway, that said, the following is a fairly standard, and I think a pretty good definition, um, which one, however, which I have a small quibble with, but I'll get to that in just a moment. One standard definition of philosophy is one, the effort to address important questions about life, which two, are not amenable to empirical investigation by three, by use of reason. Let me talk a little bit about each one of those. So it's about important questions of life. What is truth? Is truth knowable? What is the, which is epistemology? What is the nature of reality? That's metaphysics. Um, it's not about things that are trivial. What did the Cardassians wear at the Met um, Hall, for example? Ah, that wouldn't be philosophy. Um, a second statement is important because at such time as something can be subjected to empirical investigation, it is more aptly the subject for science instead of philosophy. This is why philosophy is sometimes called the mother of the sciences, because most areas of scientific investigation were initially covered by philosophy until scholars figured out a way to subject the given phenomena to definition, measurement, and experimental testing, either in a laboratory environment and or measured and recorded with scientific instrumentation. Second, I quibble with the third part of this definition because as per Alpha North Whitehead's uh, book, Process and Reality, I do think there is room for intuition uh, in the process. Intuition is great when it comes to uh, attaining or intuiting a new insight. But as even Alfred North Whitehead observed, once you've had an intuition, you need to subject it to, um, to verification. You have to show that this intuition is logical, that it's coherent, that it's necessary, and ideally has more explanatory power than the prior understanding. Now, religion. Another, again, we have another key term which people in the field of religious studies, I'm not a theologian, I am a scholar in religious studies, related but distinct. Scholars in religious studies, what we study is what theologians do. But we're looking at world religions from the outside in, not from within a particular understanding or 
received wisdom of one particular tradition. So one standard definition of religion, and I think you'll see the relationship fairly shortly, is that our religion is the effort to address important questions about life, which too are not amenable to empirical investigation. And three, by use of reason, but also intuition, doctrine, ritual, mythology. As you can see, there's a considerable overlap between philosophy and religion. The essential distinction being that although they both try to address the same kind of issues, world religions have a deeper and wider toolkit, so to speak, in order to do that. That brings me to a third term, which although mentioned in the first chapter, I think is cogent to what the, our writer seems to be doing there. Theology. Now, it's worth observing that theology only arises in doctrinal religions, religions in which orthodoxy, which is to say correct belief, is at least as important or more important than orthopraxis, correct practices. Many religions, however, such as Shinto, um, have little use, need, or use for theology because they really don't have doctrine. They're all about correct ritual or ceremony. Um, therefore, you people practicing Shinto, you could have a dozen different understandings of uh, belief in Shinto. What matters is that the people engaging in a ritual or ceremony do so with proper reverence and with the in the correct manner. So that said, theology sets out to address problems, issues, and conflicts that arise with doctrinal religions, largely through the use of the tools of philosophy. As a result, there's often overlap between philosophy and theology. And indeed, great theologians like Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine can also be studied as philosophy, but important, uh, but up to the point where they affirm religious doctrine on the basis of scripture instead of reason. Thus, um, theology is typically delimited, delimited within one given religion or closely related families of religion. Thus, we can refer legitimately to Judeo-Christian theology or when focusing on the common traits of Indic religions, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, we can refer to the shared theology of Dharmic religions, religions from which the concept of Dharma is a cardinal point. Now, I have to give our author credit for bringing up some important types of theism, polytheism, henotheism, and pantheism. But there's a lot of others. Let me share a few important ones with you all. Panentheism holds that the universe is contained within deity, but that there's something about deity that transcends the universe. It's essentially a compromised position between the notion of a transcendent God, a God that's somewhere out there separate from creation, an imminent, imminent God, a God that is the same as its creation. Um, deism accepts that there is an all good creator God but holds that this God can best be known via the application of reason to its creation. The analogy I'd like to use is if you really want to understand an author, you read the author's books. If you want to understand an artist, you look carefully at the artist's paintings. And if you want to understand a creator God, maybe it makes sense to look at his creation. Um, they also deny authority of, of scripture the existence of miracles or divine intervention. Here's a classic theist metaphor. They often share this notion. Let us say for the sake of argument that you're walking in the forest and as you walk in the forest, you can come across a watch. This is a, a watch that was made by my grandfather who was a watchmaker. Well, if you see a watch in the forest, do you just assume that it spontaneously occurred or do you assume that there must perforce be a watchmaker? Um, but 
here's the thing then. If you want to understand the creation, the creator, you look at the creation. Similarly, however, the ideas want to step or two further because they said that a all perfect, all good creator would create a perfect and all good world. But they looked at the world around them and they said, dude, things are messed up. So they assumed that their creator God, nature's God, or the God of nature is what they refer to him as. You'll find that phrase incidentally in the Declaration of Independence. Yes, Jefferson was a deist. Um, they assumed that an all good, perfect creator God would create a perfect universe. And having created a perfect universe, why would he want to have anything further to do with it? Thus, if the world was evil in society, the responsibility fell to humankind to do something about it. Um, Autotheism. Autotheism is the notion that deity, whether transcendent or not, can be found and experienced within yourself. It's a common trait of the Dharmic religions. So in Buddhism, they hold there's something called Buddha nature. And you come to know Buddha nature through Buddhist meditation. Um, similarly, in Hinduism, we find uh, the practice of yoga. And it's thought that by practicing yoga, you can become in touch with that part of the universe, of the, the um, soul of the universe, which they call Brahman, the divine consciousness in all things. Um, similar concept in Jainism. Maltheism is the notion that deity exists, that it, that it is malevolent. A popular expression of this idea can be found in the works of one of my favorite authors, H.P. Lovecraft. But it's also present in Gnosticism and Manichaeism, which distinguish between, between an all good ultimate deity, which being all good is beyond the need or use of a creation. Um, this ultimate deity is known in the Apocryphon and John, which can be found at the non Kamadi Library as the Monad. And they posited a later flawed, malevolent emanation from the, that ultimate deity um, in the Apocryphon and John. John is referred to as Iadabalos, same root as a word diabolical. Um, now they believe that this flawed entity created a flawed world and universe in its own image. Malthus effectively reason about the nature of deity on the basis of inductive reason, observing in creation the presence of evil and violence, they infer from its creation an inimical creator. By contrast, eutheists, those who believe in an entirely beneficent deity, operate deductively proceeding from the assumption of an entirely beneficent creator God, but then have to come to terms with accounting for the evil and violence that are all too evident in society and the world. I uh, probably should elaborate on those two terms. Induction is when you reason from specifics to general principles, whereas deduction is when you start with a general principle and infer specifics. So, now, there's a number of other theisms, but I think these are sufficient to highlight an issue with the way our writer is using the term theism. He defines this term as the dominant idea of God in Western civilization, then is the idea of a supremely good being, creator of, but separate from, and independent of the world, all-powerful, omnipotent, all-knowing, omniscient, eternal, and self-existent. Each of those elements, however, would be contested by one or another of the major forms of theism. Gnosticism and Manichaeism, being Malthusist, will contend on the basis of their observations with the notion of an omnibenevolent deity that created such a flawed and often, honestly, sometimes evil world. Pantheists and panentheists would question the notion of the creator that is discrete and separate from its creation. And the understanding of the gods in the polytheistic religions, such as in antiquity, the Greeks and the Romans and the Norse, 
and also in contemporary Hinduism, I might add, although extremely powerful, are powerful only within their particular area of specialization. Aries, for example, would be the most powerful being in the context of war, uh, for Gaidi in the area of law. Um, but they're not all powerful. They're not all known. They are neither eternal nor uh, self-existent. So, any thoughts there? Particularly given that in the first chapter, we encounter many broad statements of truth that are either not supported or in the five footnotes, only five, are supported via the ideas of Christian theologians. And for all his claim to describe the deity of the Abrahamic traditions in general, there is, I have to point out, no reference to ideas either from learned rabbis or imams from the clergy in Judaism or Islam. Is, it, is he really doing philosophy in this chapter per se? Or is he doing something closer to theology? What do you think? Well, that's my announcement. If time permits, I might make one or two observations about his arguments for the existence of God. I think there are one or two issues that he does not address, but I'll see if I have enough time. Ciao for now.